Overclocking TV. Again, this year we have the pleasure of having a one-on-one -on -one with Intel, and this time with Christian Anderka. Christian, can you please present yourself? Yes, so my name is Christian Anderka. I work at Intel. I'm actually supporting major customers in Europe on their technical issues um, when they happen. Uh, we've listed a couple of, of topics for, for Christian that we find interesting for the end users. Uh, as everyone knows, there'll be an upcoming platform, the 2011. Christian, can you tell us any details about this? What we can expect from the platform? What sort of platform will it be? We know it won't be a mobile platform, so please tell us a little about the platform. So as usual, you know, uh, on unannounced products, it's kind of difficult for us to comment too much into the details. But what I can tell you that we're actually planning a new platform uh, more towards the server and workstation market that is going to use a new socket. Um, and as you rightfully mentioned, it's going to be the LGA 2011 socket. That's got nothing to do with the year, it's actually the number of contacts, as usually it is. Um, we're going to see a lot of uh, interesting features on that platform. Uh, it's going to be based on the Sandy Bridge microarchitecture that we launched earlier this year, quite successfully with lots of new features. And we have a few new goodies in petto for, for this new platform. But you know, I have to um, uh, revert you to um, uh, events, for example, like the upcoming IDF, uh, where we're going to share a little bit more information, just not yet, because right now we're still really happy uh, that we got Sandy Bridge desktop and mobile out of the door. Which is really nice for the users as well, except that it, it doesn't, unfortunately, doesn't scale with cool, but for, for the normal user, for the end user, it's quite well, it's a nice product. Christian, one specific question regarding the 2011. Can you confirm or decline or not comment uh, about the quad channel? Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the details we haven't disclosed yet, so unfortunately I'm not able to confirm or decline anything on that one. Um, also, I have another question related to, in the past we've seen the platform of Skulltrail. Uh, can we expect any sort of these products coming in the, the upcoming couple of years? Is it on the schedule for Intel to implement a 2P uh, solution for the end user, for not the desktop, but the workstation? <laughs> yes, um, we haven't given up at all on our multi-socket uh, platforms. As you know, in server world, we actually do ship uh, platforms that have more than one socket enabled. Um, and, um, you know, going forward, you should definitely expect uh, an Intel platform that supports um, two sockets uh, for CPUs. These platforms typically are more geared towards workstation markets, so it's not so much um, the um, the enthusiasts that Intel has in mind when we develop those platforms, because it's really for the workstation. However, there's nothing that stops an OEM or a motherboard manufacturer to actually take those building blocks and create a, a platform that is very much geared towards a high-end desktop user. Well, well, in the past, there's been one, one thing blocking, and it's been the PCI Express lanes, that you haven't had the opportunity of, of using a multi-graphic card solution. Unlike with the Skull Trail, it was actually geared towards the, the opportunity uh, of using multi -plat uh, graphic platform. Will this happen again? Well, um, since the Skull Trail platform, a lot of things have happened in the graphics market. Um, the SLI configurations are less restrictive as they have been in that time frame. So, um, as I understand the market today, there's actually um, no big blocking factor that would stop somebody from putting in more than one graphics card into a platform that has enough PCI Express lanes to support those kind of configurations. Now from our building block perspective, uh, if an OEM or a motherboard manufacturer wants to create such a solution, there is nothing that we do that stops our customers to provide that. Well, I'm not able to tell you uh, about the plans of those OEMs because that's their decision to disclose those. Uh, but what I can confirm to you is that from an Intel platform perspective, there's nothing that keeps an OEM um, to, to, um, to create such a platform and, and provide it to enthusiasts. Thanks. And for our users, there's word going on at uh, CBIT this year that nobody unfortunately had confirmed, but it's definitely there. Um, NVIDIA has approved PLX in making the replacement of the Enforce 200 from NVIDIA. Therefore, it will be possible to go with SLI and three-way and four-way later on, even more easily for Intel and for AMD for that matter. So that's beneficial on, on that point of view. 
Um, I have another question for you. There's a really nice platform at the moment on the market, the Sandy Bridge. And um, as we all know, because it's official, and uh, you can even find it through Google, there'll be a replacement, a dice rink, according to the TikTok plan as well, uh, the Ivy Bridge. Exactly. That's the code name of our new um, processor that is based on the 22 nanometer process technology. Uh, it's going to follow on to Sandy Bridge, uh, but it's going to take a while before we introduce that product. As you rightfully said, we just recently launched Sandy Bridge, so right now we're really focused on Sandy Bridge uh, from a marketing standpoint. But of course, within development, within our engineering departments, um, since Sandy Bridge has been launched, uh, all our eyes are now on the next generation exactly. within Intel. Um, and for that matter, uh, many of our viewers have been a bit frustrated that the Sandy Bridge, uh, it scales pretty much the same on, on air and uh, on more exotic cooling, such as liquid nitrogen or dry ice for that matter. While the Gulf Town, the, the very top model and still the top model from Intel, mm -hmm. and at a completely different prime price range, of course, it's the premium edition. Um, it scales very well with cool. Can, what can we expect from the Ivy Bridge? Is there any word that it's been optimized towards the enthusiasts or will, uh, will be still targeted to the mainstream and not that much in focus? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the overclocking capabilities of our CPUs. Exactly, exactly. Um, as you know, we're testing and validating our products to operate against our specifications. Um, and overclocking has always been and is continuing to be a market where you basically have to have some luck as well because not all of our CPUs are getting out of the factory exactly the same. We guarantee that they work according to the specification, but we don't give any guarantees beyond the specifications. And this is not going to change a lot uh, from this perspective. Well, what I can tell is that, of course, if we're planning an enthusiast platform, we're also looking at what are those enthusiasts really interested in. And uh, we are very well aware of the overclocking community, as you might know. And while I'm not able to confirm a specific feature, um, you should watch out for the upcoming um, enthusiast platform that is going to replace Gulf Town um, later this year. And and uh, you know, I'm not able to give you a good guidance on on its overclocking scalability with regards to air cooling or liquid nitrogen cooling or anything than that. Uh, but what I can tell you is that you should watch out for that new platform if you're a high-end user with you know, uh, a good budget and then I think you're going to get a great platform even for overclocking purposes. But uh, is the strategy maintained with uh, one being mainstream uh, and the other one being the enthusiast? Now we have the Sandy Bridge which is supposed to be mainstream, really nice mainstream for, for the record. And we have the Tyderberg, the X58. Mm -hmm. uh, will it be the same with the upcoming generation with the Ivy Bridge versus the LJ2011? Will it be the same to distinguish of uh, re really separating the enthusiast and the mainstream? Or how will, will Intel handle this? Now, if you look at our roadmap positioning right now, you, you totally right, we do have the Sandy Bridge products mostly in the mainstream. But then, as usual, you know, if you configure things right, you can get Sandy Bridge quite high up in the stack, right? Because Sandy Bridge is a very powerful uh, and, and high performing uh, product. So, so you can actually go up quite high in the stack, which is great because it allows you to, to get a rather, you know, modest priced motherboard uh, with a very nice CPU and then you get high performance out of it. Now, for the people who want more, who want to have a higher number of cores, uh, who are looking for more features, who are looking for more I.O. capabilities, for example, a higher number of PCI Express lanes, um, there is that Tylersburg-based platform, the X58-based platform. Um, that uh, X58-based platform is going to be replaced later on by a new generation. We discussed this earlier in, in, in our talk here. Um, now, so you could argue, well, that segmentation actually stays. They're not being refreshed all at the same time. So we started off with the mainstream refreshing to Sandy Bridge. And later on, we will uh, refresh the very high end um, with, with that type of generation. Um, and 
and you know it's going to be still the segmentation you can get you know an even faster platform um, if, if, if you're willing to invest that money uh, with with the high-end platform that we're going to bring out later this year but the, the reason why I asked you about the distinguishes that I would personally imagine that Sandy Bridge, as we know it now, with the LGA 1155, will remain the same amount of cores and threads because it's dual channel. And the hyper-threading is solely depending on the memory bandwidth, and it's still limited to dual channel. While if we, in case, as the rumor says, it will be quad channel on the new platform, it'll give the opportunity to run much extra cores because the, the hyper-threading cores or hyper-threading threads and they will be running off the memory, so it needs the extra bandwidth. Which leads me to a completely change in topic. Before we go there, I just wanted to clarify one thing. So from our perspective, hyper-threading is not necessarily limited by memory bandwidth. It really depends a lot on the software load that you have there. As you, um, I'm sure you are aware, is hyper-threading makes use of um, one core, and it allows to run two threads on one core. Now. There are instantiations where um, a memory bottleneck uh, is basically helping uh, or is be being overcome by hyperthreading, basically, because while one thread is waiting for data from the memory, the other thread can execute and use all the resources. So that is a perfect example of what hyperthreading does. And actually, what then happens if you have more memory bandwidth available, the benefits of hyperthreading would go away. But if you look at different work, and use cases, uh, what we see is that hyperthreading actually is beneficial to a lot of different use cases as long, and this is an important point to, to keep in mind, as long as software is threaded and makes use of threading. Unfortunately, uh, we still see a lot of software out there that is not threaded very well. So basically, this is uh, a request to all the developers out there, uh, start programming in, 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 uh, with multiprocessor systems in mind. Thank you for your time. No problem at all. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.